That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And tonight we're here to talk about The Marrying Man, a 1991 film uh, directed by Jerry Reese, Reese uh, written by the famous Neil Simon and starring Kim Basinger and Alec Baldwin, which is where they met. It was released in April of 1991 uh, by Buena Vista Pictures. It cost $26 million to make, and it made 12.5. Uh, this will be the first time it'll be on Blu-ray as of August 20th, and um, it's our, both our first time seeing the film. Yes. So I was inspired to see the film after reading Alec Baldwin's memoir, entitled Nonetheless. Um, You're a big Alec fan. I'm a big Alec fan. Uh, he talked about this film as sort of um, his big opportunity to shine as a leading man and was very disappointed that it turned out to be a flop and was just not a good movie in general. Um, there was also a lot of sort of like public scrutiny about the film because there were rumors of Kim Basinger being difficult and then being a volatile couple, which in his memoir he says is not true. The rumors were sort of based around Kim Basinger pushing back against the filmmaker because her character- Well, pushing back against Neil Simon. Right. The script. The script, which we can get into in a second. Um, but there were other little rumors, like she demanded Avion to wash her hair, which he says is not true. So that sparked my interest. So when uh, we received the film, I was very interested in watching it. Uh, sadly, this is not a good movie. Uh, <laughs> so it's based on a story that Neil Simon heard, heard. about Carrie Fisher's stepfather, um, uh, who was obviously married to Debbie Reynolds at one point in time. Carrie Fisher described as... Uh, an ugly man with money, so someone they would call distinguished, and his obsession with a uh, Vegas showgirl uh, that he ended up marrying four times. Uh, Which was notable in itself, however, she was the girlfriend of Bugsy Malone, the famous gangster. So it made for a good, what I would consider like a good story to tell at like a party or a bar. So apparently Neil Simon heard the story and thought he would make a movie about it. So Neil Simon is a very, very famous, renowned uh, playwright. He wrote The Odd Couple. He wrote The Heartbreak Kid. He wrote um, The Goodbye Girl, which won Marsha Mason, who he used to be married to, and Rich Dreyfus, Best Actor and Actress at the Oscars. Um, he has He's a very well-known body of work. Sure. And Kim Basinger fought, fought back because she thought that the women uh, were... Uh, are kind of archaically portrayed, and it's, it is very demeaning. It's it, Kim Basinger is also joined by Elizabeth Shue as the other uh, major female role, and they're both painted very demeaningly, kind of like as animals. For men. So, in fairness to the writer, this the the story is set between 1948 and 1956. So that period in time was not the best for women, <laughs> and being treated as you know anything more than objects. So I can appreciate. The, the story staying true to what it actually was. The problem is that this is supposed to be a comedy and it's not funny. No. So then if it's not funny, then what is it? Well, it's not a good love story either. These two characters, Alec Baldwin, um, who plays, um, he has an interesting name and I just forgot it. It's Pearly. Uh, Chan Pearl is, is Mr. Pearl. Daniel Pearl? No, it's like Chan. Well, I can't believe we just forgot his name. Anyway, his character <laughs> and then Kim Basinger, they also don't have any chemistry. They don't seem to... They fall in love and get married four times, but I don't know how or why. Um, so I think... I can see why she had problems with the script, even if it goes beyond just, like, telling the true story of a thing that happened in a certain period of time. So uh, the story is very basic. Uh Yes. Alec Baldwin's character, who um, is very wealthy, he's the heir to a toothpaste dynasty. Mm -hmm. He's scheduled to marry the daughter of like the most powerful producer in Hollywood, um, and she's played by Elizabeth Shue. And the father's played by Robert Loggia. Okay, so um, before he marries her, his four buddies, who are like these parasitic guys, uh, who, uh, yes, um, who who say that they only are with him because he's rich and pays for everything. Who two of them are P Paul Reiser, who narrates uh, very obnoxiously. Yeah, and Fisher Stevens, who is very unappealing in this. They take him to Vegas for his bachelor party, and while he's there, he meets Kim Basinger's character, Vicky, Vicky Anderson. Yeah, who's Bugsy Malone's. 
girlfriend. Girlfriend. He falls in love with her immediately and marry. Well, he falls in love with her immediately or in lust with her. Mm-hmm. Is having sex with her and gets caught by Bugsy Malone. Mm-hmm. So instead of being killed, or as Bugsy says, putting him in cement shoes, his punishment for them is to make them get married to embarrass. Yes, because it kind of derails um, Baldwin's character because he knows he's about to be married to this movie mogul's daughter, and it's going to cause a lot of embarrassment. Um, right. Armand Asante plays Bugsy Malone, and I think he's the best part of the movie. Um, and also, as a side note, there were three different portrayals of Bugsy Malone in 1991. Ben Kingsley for his Oscar-nominated performance in Bugsy, and then Richard Grieco in Mobsters, which I haven't seen. Okay. So the story is long. He basically marries, uh, Alec Baldwin's character marries Vicki Anderson four times. Yes. Um, Through the course of their relationship, obviously there's a lot of volatility and that's why they get divorced three times. Uh, In the course of that, he ends up moving to Boston because his father dies and he needs to take over the business, which upsets Vicki because she has aspirations to be a singer slash actor and she's not able to do that. So after their second divorce and then third remarry, or second remarry, third remarry. I don't know. They have four kids in there. Somewhere whatever. They have four kids in there. He, he uses all of his money. The last $15 million he has to build a huge movie studio so that he can um, put Vicky in the movies because no one will hire her because she's married to the man who jilted the most powerful man in Hollywood's daughter. So... That never goes anywhere. She doesn't make movies because she's busy making babies. He goes bankrupt. Their relationship dissolves. Uh, and that's kind of the end. Like, he kind of goes away. His little four parasitic friends become super successful. The film, the very first scene of the film is that it's 1956 in San Francisco. We see Kim Basinger's character singing in a lounge and then immediately cut to 1948 where Paul Reiser's narrating kind of like this crazy story. So the very end of the film is then back in 1956 in this lounge in San Francisco and we see Basinger singing. We see the four friends there watching and they have lost contact with Alec Baldwin's character. However, we see Alec Baldwin walk in at the end and it becomes clear that he's been visiting just to kind of see Basinger's character and he asks her to marry him for the fourth time and Mm -hmm. she does. And she performs the song that she first sang when they first met. Um, So it's just... (sighs) So, you know, kudos to Kim Basinger for trying to do what she could with this awful role and she was nominated for a Razzie, unfortunately. Uh, she's lost to Sean Young but you know this is this is her first role after being Vicki Vale in Batman and then it started a string of flops off in the 90s including Final Analysis with Richard Gere Cool World with Brad Pitt and um, The Real McCoy where she's a jewel thief and as we were talking also she had to file bankruptcy in this period because she she uh, backed out of Boxing Helena that awful but very fun to watch Jennifer Chambers Lynch film uh, Boxing Helena um I don't know. She did. She. They both seemed miscast. Also, because uh, Alec Baldwin's supposed to be a homely man, which he's not. And then Kim Basinger's. She's gorgeous to behold, but she's uncomfortable in her body and moving around. And we were both trying to think of other women who might have been better fits in 1991. Madonna. Uh, I thought you said Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer, for I think, sure. Kathleen Turner. Kathleen Turner. You know, because Jessica. Well, she's the voice of Jessica Rabbit. That was 89. Maybe they could have used a cartoon. That would have been better, actually. Like they do with Kim and Cool World. Or Who Framed Roger Rabbit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My biggest issue is the movie's not funny. It's supposed to be a comedy. It is not funny. I chuckled a total of three times, and they were light chuckles. Um, oh, speaking of animation, it's Jerry Reese had, had only worked on animation in the studio. The game, director. The director. And he would not make another um, live action film until 2013. Well, but, you know, the, the, so my biggest gripes are the, the for a comedy, it is not funny. It is not funny. It really does feel like an old man trying to recount a story from 40 years prior. However, now he's somewhat, you know, senile, so he can't recall all of it. Certainly not the funny parts. And then he's retelling it to, because really what's happening is like, this is a story from the early 50s being retold in the 90s. And it's just like, 
I mean, it's like watching old episodes of like All in the Family or, the, uh, you know, just an older sitcom where the jokes don't hit the same because they're inappropriate, right? Out of context, they're misogynist, yeah. racist, homophobic. It's just not funny, and that's how this film well, feels. They didn't correctly conjure the context either. Like no, like Basinger's hair, for instance, is yeah. A lot of references don't quite hit her appearance for sure. She's supposed to be this like sultry Vegas showgirl, and she's not. Kim Basinger's beautiful, but she's not sexy. She doesn't know how to move her body. She no. seems very uncomfortable. She needed to. That hair needed to look like Roddick Lake or Marilyn Monroe or some plat. Lady. Just very distracting. And I understand that she tried to push back, uh, but it's like you only do so much and she wasn't able to do it. So I still think she's a really cool performer. And this yeah. film is worth a watch because it is such an interesting uh, sort of interpretation of, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of like how Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt met on Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Mm, yeah so it's fun to kind of look back and watch that film and kind of see the chemistry they had and so to watch this film and know that that was a similar scenario and to see how uncomfortable the two of them appear is really fascinating but it's not a good movie um it was fun kind of watching just because we rolled our eyes so much and grunted and moaned but <laughs> uh for that reason i would give this film a one and a half out of five stars i give it a one out of five uh the disc from Kino Lorber, I'll give it three out of five. But I mean, unless you're hard pressed for either of the stars um, or Neil Simon, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I can't really say <laughs> this is worth watching. Anyway, bye. Bye.